Good evening and welcome to Libertarian Counterpoint. Uh, my name is Jason McPhee and I'll be your host tonight. And with me I have uh, James Just, who is the uh, Libertarian Vice Chair of Sacramento County and is running for Assembly District 7. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I, on my right I have Leon Brightwith and he is a retired engineer from the state of California and he also has a book that he recently published. Uh, Leon, you want to tell us a little about it? Yes, the name of the book is Bearing False Witness. It's a reevaluation of Christian teachings. I was raised Roman Catholic, but I've always had problems with some of the teachings of the church. So I have spent, I spent some time looking at some of what is written in the Bible and some of what is taught in the church, and I came up with what I believe is a different way of looking at our life here on earth and our life in the afterlife, if there's such a thing. And that is what I was trying to resolve with some of the conflicts I've had since I was a child. And that's what my book is about. Hmm. Sounds interesting. Yeah. yeah. Well, maybe maybe uh, there's wisdom in there that could help us understanding the the current primary fiascos. That are going on. <laughs> <laughs> you need some heavily interference to, <laughs> to understand this. As well, right now, uh, it, uh, for those of you, I, I know this show is uh, uh, may be taped at the moment, so we may not be exactly on the day. But currently, we've had uh, uh, the Democrats. Uh, they they believed that uh, Joe Biden was the anointed one, and he is flatlined essentially yes. in the first few of these. Uh, uh, and not to mention that they had a complete breakdown in their methodology of yes. counting their votes in yes. Iowa, which left everybody a bit puzzled and, and frustrated. And now uh, Bloomberg has recently entered the race and has been spending boatloads of money. And uh, they just had their first debate where they included Bloomberg and had even altered their rules to include him. Yes. <laughs> it's yes. funny because they, they weren't allowing that before, but because he spent a lot of money and gave a lot of money to the uh, some uh, Democrat causes, they've, they've uh, altered the rules for him. And then he literally got hammered last night in the primaries. And so, uh, James, did you have any thoughts on what's going on? Yeah, well, I didn't catch the debates last night, but I heard that they did kind of an epic takedown of Michael Bloomberg. I thought it was kind of vicious. I'm you know, kind of glad I didn't see it. I don't, you know, it's the kind of things you don't like to watch that kind of a train. I personally don't like to watch train wrecks. And so, but yeah, this whole thing, you know, as a party official, this whole kind of primary process that the Democrats are going through is mind boggling to me. It's like, you know, you, you're trying to, Trump is corrupt and he's, unethical and unhonest and all those kind of things. So the, the way to fight that would be to be ethical and open and transparent. And instead they're doing literally the exact opposite. They're, they're manufacturing they're manufacturing and manipulating the elections, this, this primary fiasco, even if it's just a, even if it's just a, a mistake, right? Just, just a kind of, you know, disasters happen and things happen. They didn't even deal with it properly. Yep, we messed up. You, you know, as a party official, I'm going, this is easy PR. We messed up, we screwed up, we rushed an app that wasn't ready and we're paying the price for that. We're, we're, gonna, we're gonna fix it and move forward. And you just move forward. But they kind of blame the Russians and all kinds of stuff. I don't know, they've kind of lost their way. Well, you know, and it's funny too, because I, I, I haven't been able to uh, uh, get past the fact that with, with all of the baggage Trump has, you would think all you need to do to be able to really put a good challenge to him is to just not be crazy, and it seems no. to be beyond <laughs> team it's beyond blue. Their capability. <laughs> not to be totally crazy. beyond their capability. <laughs> now, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say Joe Biden has flatline. Okay, I think Joe Biden is heading south quickly. Um, but you know, this whole thing about about the fiasco in, in in Iowa. What is amazing to me, and and this is not my original thought here, is these people cannot even count their votes, but they want to manage our health care. I mean, this is unbelievable to me, that the, there are people in this country who are seriously thinking that these people could do a better job than the free market could in giving them health care and health insurance and all these things that we need to, um, to have that kind of service. So it's just, it's just ridiculous to me. Well, you know, and, and what strikes me about that too, you know, is it. Uh, these the, the people on Team Blue have been absolutely um, upside down and beside themselves about Trump being elected for the mm. last three years. They yes. haven't been able to to rest. Uh, like you say, it's a uh, Russia. It's uh, one thing or another. There, there's something. But 
then they're so dissatisfied with having somebody like Trump as their president, and then they want to give more power to government. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah. There's, yes. a, there's a rising tide of fascism in our government. Yes. Let's give the government the tools it needs yeah. to be fascist. Yeah, right. <laughs> going, yes. Especially here in California, you know, people are across the country, they're complaining about Trump, and I'm going, well, that's great, and I agree with you, but I live in California, and my, my fascist problems are actually much closer to home. You know, it, it's it's the state of California that's telling me how I have to work, how I can and can't work. It's the state of California that wants to put me in jail because I or fine me because I use a plastic straw wrong. You know, it's it's not it's the state of California that wants to do that. It's not it's not Trump. Trump has his own laundry list of problems, but you know these are the ones that affect me every day. Trump's problems are kind of you know they're bigger, they're esoteric, they're they're a thousand miles away essentially. The state of California problems are quite literally at my front door. And so that's why I kind of end up focusing on that. Well, and, and some, of the, some of the hidden problems of Trump, too, is the, the massive amount of debt that we've been piling up. But if you look at Team Blue's solutions, it seems to be literally priceless government policies. Yeah. <laughs> that they just they, they can't even identify a price tag for Bernie's health care plan. Yeah. <laughs> Medicare, <laughs> Medicare for all. Yeah. Let's cancel all student, all student debt. And there's one yes. big program after another, after another. At, and who is going to pay for all of this? It's the working people, right? Not even the working people, it's the working people's children and grandchildren will be paying for all of this nonsense. But it seems like Team Blue, as you, as you call them, they have no faith in the marketplace at all. None whatsoever. And they a tremendous amount of faith in government. Exactly. <laughs> and, 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 you know, and you know the fascinating thing about all of this? Socialism is the only thing that has failed everywhere it's been tried, but yet there are people who continually promote it. Yeah. And yet there are people who fall for the nonsense of politicians about socialism. Yes. That is beyond me. Yeah, and it's, and it's kind of mind-boggling to me that these, these people understand that tariffs, that the consumer pays all, to all tax, you know, right. pays the price of tariffs, yes. but somehow the consumer doesn't pay the price of tax increases. The end consumer pays all costs. That's what cost structures work, right? You pass right. your costs on. A tax is just a cost. You pass it on. And rich people didn't get rich because they don't pass costs on, right? They, get, they, got, they got rich because they know how to pass costs on. You can't have it both ways. You can't say those greedy rich, rich people will do everything to save a buck and then say, well, they're just going to pay their taxes and not pass it on. It, they're just going to pass it on. Yeah. And so even their own theories don't actually work if you actually think past them any, any two, three steps. Well, in, in, you know, uh, one of the things, too, that this brings up for me is that, uh, you know, maybe, maybe this year we've got a little bit of hope with the libertarian crop that's uh, coming up. Uh, we have Lincoln Chafee is uh, now running in the uh, libertarian primaries, and he has been a governor and a senator, so, you know, maybe he brings some gravitas to the situation. Um, I know they have some other uh, interesting candidates running as well. But, uh, did, James, did you have any insights on our, our libertarian chances here in the primaries? <laughs> well, well, our libertarian chances, well, libertarians were an interesting thing. We actually still elect our, our, our presidential nominee at the convention. So essentially our, our nomination process, the, the primary process for presidential is essentially advisory. You're kind of advising what you want your delegates to do when you go there. And it's not even like you know, a lot of times their, their first ballots are kind of mandated by the thing. We don't even have that. Your delegates just to get to go and decide. But we're still small enough where that's actually a reasonable, a reasonable thing to do. We're not like the big, huge national parties now where you kind of have to do it the way they do. But, and then they interject these things. But for the libertarians, I haven't actually decided who I'm going to support. I kind of decided that you know there's only one of the presidential candidates that I can't support. So I'm just going to support whoever we actually nominate cause, and kind of work for them. Because for us, it's more about promoting our philosophy and promoting... The fact that we have a different way of moving forward, the chances of us winning a presidential election are slim to none. I mean, so it's not going to happen. But we can use it to help the people down ballots, people like myself. You know, we can help explain the stre we can help explain the philosophy, and maybe those because we're such a divisive time that people say, you know what, we're going to take a chance. We're going to send a message. We're going to send something different. Well, you know, and the red and blue teams are in an unprecedented spiral. And as you mentioned, both of them want to outspend each other to our ever in, uh, to our detriment uh, down the road. In fact, it's, it's funny if you take the time to look up a uh, graph of our, uh, of our debt to GDP, uh, that's our gross domestic product, and you'll see that uh, we are literally 
you know, beyond levels that we had after World War II. In World yeah. War II, you know, we were literally trying to stop the worst, you know, shadow of of uh, dictatorship from creeping over the world that we've yeah. really ever known yeah. and we had something to show for that now it's what do we have to show except for a bunch of people asking for more free stuff <laughs> exactly exactly yeah and not yeah. even fixing the problems right yeah. it's not yeah. they're not actually even like student loan debt okay what's we going to for, forgive student loan debt but are we going to actually do something about why college is so expensive before we do that if we're gonna if you're gonna do something about student loan debt okay fine maybe that's maybe we need to maybe not but can we at least before we do that? Can we can we tackle the problem of the cost, mm -hmm. so so that we don't so we're not spending so much dang money? But I don't think we should be doing anything about student loan debt. These are people who freely chose to engage in this and and taking the debt from wherever they got the, the loans, mm -hmm. and then they should be responsible to pay it back. Well, that's I, what I did when I went to college. That's what I did. Why? Well, if they're going to pay me back for what I did, then then maybe I, I might I might agree. But if you're not going to pay me back or not going to pay back all the people or parents, for instance, I, I have a, I'm a parent of, of two, two boys who I got through college and I had loans and everything to do it and that kind of stuff. So they're going to forgive everybody else. What about me? Yeah. Yeah. yeah what about me? And what about those who, who didn't take online debt, who yes. worked and, and worked very hard to minimize their costs or exactly. took on the minimum amount of debt? And you got the, the other people who took on 40K of debt. Yeah. For partying, right? I was yeah. listening to a, a guy on a podcaster, and he said he spent forty thousand dollars of student loan debt essentially to party. Right. Yeah. And so those guys shouldn't have their their debt taken. But there's also an argument that a lot of the student loan debt is actually a, a fraud, where the, the education system and these universities have engaged in fraud. And so we sh maybe we, the solution is to allow these students to sue these schools. Well, you know, part of, maybe part so. of the issue too is that we've gone away from markets with respect to education. You know, we have this huge distortion of government money in the form of guaranteed loans that people mm. can get in order to go. Uh, they've been told the message that uh, hammered through government education that uh, it doesn't matter what you do, just go get a college degree. It really doesn't matter, just follow your dreams. And unfortunately, a lot of people's dreams are taking them into an awful lot of debt. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and then they find out that there's not a lot of market demand for their dream after they get that degree. <laughs> so I mean, this is one of those things where I, I think maybe we need a little bit more uh, uh, market input into into education in order to get the right signal. You know, M Milton Friedman mm -hmm. had an idea of, of tie the college's fate to the student's fate so that yeah. the, uh, the, the college either has to be the one to make the loan or somehow or other they're invested in that student and their future earnings. So then the college suddenly is invested in their future and is exactly. not going to teach yeah. things that have no market yeah. demand. Yeah, yeah so. the college but, should be on the hook for that loan, right. not, not taxpayers. So yeah. the college is, is the one making sure they're not overspending. The college is the one making sure that that, that is actually a useful education and not taxpayers who have no way of actually doing that. And, and mm -hmm. I mean, you, you, you just alluded to the point of students coming out with this nice fancy degree and they can't find work. It's the kind of education that these kids are getting in school today that we're talking about. Some, you know, this kind of study and that kind of study, Asian American study, African American study, this kind of stuff. I mean, uh, those things are fine as historical things, but what are they, are they, do they have any market value? Yeah. That is the issue. And there are many colleges teaching these things as, oh, we are, we are proud, we proudly have these programs uh, for our great students. But then they can't find jobs. What are they going to do with the debt they have acquired to go to your school? Well, sadly, they end up in marketing, and that's how you end up with all this woke marketing and all these companies that, that kind of end up having going broke and their marketing campaigns going broke because they have people who have a distorted view of the world because all they've done is gone through college and gone through these these ethnic studies, these various studies programs that don't actually give them a well-rounded education. Yeah, it gives them a, yes. a focused education. And it's fine. You know, these things are actually in, important to do, but having your whole education focused on that, on is, that. Is, 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 mm -hmm. is probably a mistake. Absolutely. Well, now, moving along from the, uh, some of the issues of the primaries, I wanted to touch on a few issues of Trump and, uh, and his leadership. Uh, one of the things recently that's been in the news is uh, he had uh, inserted himself into Roger Stone's uh, sentencing um, uh, prescriptions, uh, the, the recommendations that prosecutors had given after he'd been found uh, guilty. And even more recently, uh, he's also uh, 
commuted and pardoned some different people. Uh, Blagonovich, I guess, yes, from um, Illinois, uh, former uh, governor, who yes. was essentially trying to sell Barack Obama's mm -hmm. Senate yes, seat, <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> among other things. Yes. And so, you know, but this this brings up the question: Is is this uh, is this an example of executive corruption, or is there any sense to it? Uh, well, Leon? well, okay, it is true. I mean, Donald Trump said that he is the chief law enforcement officer of the land, which is absolutely true. And he does have a right to intervene in any case that he wish, he wish to do so in. However, our, our traditions have been for the, the White House to keep itself separated from the Justice Department, even though they are both in the executive branch of government. So when Trump inserts himself into the... Into, into, um, into these cases, especially cases involving um, people that he'd been associated with, like, like Roger Stone, it does give the appearance of something unethical that's going on. Now, I happen to believe that Bill Barr is a man of impeccable integrity, and Trump should let the man do his job instead of him mouthing off about who is being treated on fear and all this kind of nonsense. It, it really and truly leaves a bad taste in the mouth of people listening to Trump talking about his friend being, on, being treated unfairly in, in, in the justice system. And the justice system is headed, the Justice Department is headed by a man he appointed. Yeah. So, so well, you know, in a lot of ways, too, it's, it, what also makes it different is that uh, he's doing this uh, midterm. A lot of times uh, presidents do this on their way out of office. True. For better or worse. Yes. I mean, sometimes it's just completely corrupt who they're, who they're pardoning. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, in a way, you can actually... It, you can actually kind of respect that he's going to he does this now and so he's going to have to face the voters in November mm -hmm. over these decisions so in a, in, a, in a way you it's can a actually point. kind of respect it. and I yeah. for me I have mixed feelings over these kind of things because uh, for me prosecutors are actually one of the biggest criminals in our criminal justice system <laughs> it, it's so so I have an issue with prosecutors but at the same time you know I have an issue with the president interjecting themselves in this now past presidents have done it they just usually do it quietly yes. and Trump does it you know on Twitter and so there's so so the essential isn't that Trump does it anymore. It's just he does it openly. Openly. Yes. Mm -hmm. And exactly. so what, exactly. is that better or worse? I, I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I don't actually know. I would like them not to do it. Right. But at the same time, I would like to be able to trust the Justice Department and the prosecutors to be to be open and fair. But we also know that that doesn't happen. Sure. It's not even regarding Trump or not even politics. It's prosecutors. Their goal is to prosecute people. They don't even care if you're innocent. Mm -hmm. And so we kind of. Got this. It's, I live in this strange land on this kind of on this topic like this. I don't actually kind of know exactly how I feel because I'm kind of sitting in both in kind of both fences. You know, but but the one thing I, um, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. The one thing I may add to that though is that I think the media has a role in all of this and how they present this to to the average viewer. I mean, I remember Obama said while the Justice Department was investigating Hillary Clinton about over the email. The email, um, the email stuff that she had engaged in. Um, Barack Obama said, "No, I don't think she broke the law." Now nobody made us think about that. Now that's a serious intervention in a case that is ongoing, all right? Because he, as the chief law enforcement officer of the land, is already proclaiming her innocence. And j just a little while after, she was let off by the by James Comey. But the point is, though, now Trump comes out with his loudmouth and says something. I mean, about being unfair to Roger Stone and all that kind of stuff. And the media makes a big deal out of that. When they should have made an equally big deal about what Obama said. Right? I mean, mm. I think both of them should have said nothing, quite frankly. Because that, to me, they are intervening in ongoing cases. But how the media treats it, I think, is different. Well, one depending the, on who the president is. Well, one of the concerns with this, too, is just the idea that if, if we... we apparently have little faith in our system if we think we need to have constant interventions where we're just relying on the judgment of, of one central planner, you know, one king or dictator, you know, yeah, a, yeah. A, a, not, not to say, you know, comparison-wise with Trump and other presidents, but it just, just to say that it, clearly we, we're uh, moving much f far away from a process and just relying on some you know, leader to to give yes. us his take yeah, on the law. I wouldn't be comfortable even if I had that, right? One of those things. <laughs> yeah, no, course, I, yeah. There's too much power even for me. <laughs> yes, yes. We should, give, we should dissolve yeah. some of that. Yeah. But speaking of, of, I guess, 
giving his opinion on, uh, you know, uh, issues of law. Uh, re recently, uh, Trump was uh, celebrating, I guess, uh, China's way of dealing with uh, people convicted of drug crimes in China, which is to execute drug dealers. <laughs> and, and, and Trump was actually uh, uh, quoted as saying, well, he thinks it's a great thing, you know, the way they deal with their drug <laughs> dealers. So, so I, I was curious uh, what fellow libertarians had to think about that. <laughs> Punishing people for what they do to their own bodies fundamentally is, is a human rights violation. You know, but with Trump, it's always hard to know exactly what the heck he's talking about or, or what he's actually referring to. Does he even, or does he even know what they actually do with the, <laughs> with the, you know? That's the open question. Does Trump, is he, or is he just spouting off, someone asking him a question, he says, oh yeah, they're great. And, and so what did they do? I think you know, in this case, he knew it was capital you know, punishment. <laughs> <laughs> and so because I didn't see it, you know, I don't know. I can always go with that. Well, yeah, but was he actually saying anything? Because Trump says a lot of things that he doesn't actually say anything. And so, you know, so I kind of wonder if that, but fundamentally, capital punishment for doing something to yourself is a fundamental human rights violation. Yes. It's, a, it's a human rights crime, and we should actually view it that way. About Donald Trump in particular, you know, I really believe Trump says things just to stay in the news, okay? Seriously. Sometimes I don't think he even believes what he's saying, but he just wants to stay in the news because this is how he got elected, and this is how I think he will get reelected. He just wants to stay in the news. So, I mean, about, about this thing about, about celebrating China's, I mean, if you want to take that on a, on, a serious, on a serious note, I mean, I think it's quite ridiculous that an American president will ever, will ever think that this is something good, okay? I mean, we, we live in a country where we're supposed to have a bunch of individual rights, and they're codified in our constitution, and an American president celebrating something so barbaric, I think, is, 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 is beyond me, all right? So... Well, speaking of China and uh, how they deal with uh, rights to people, uh, the coronavirus is something that continues to stir the news, and of course that uh, it springs out of China. Yeah. Um, but uh, recently there's been some quarantines of cruise ships yes. and a lot of concern. The death toll now I checked today, and it's uh, well over 2,000 people right. have uh, succumbed to it, including one of the initial doctors who uh, identified the problem. Yes. <laughs> and... Um, so I, I, I guess this brings up a, a fundamental question to me about what it means to be a libertarian and uh, should a disease come to our shores. And right now, 2000, you know, it's, it's less than the common flu, but just to put it in perspective. But if, if it does happen to be some kind of a pandemic, how should libertarians feel about things like quarantines? Yeah, well, the coronavirus itself is it's actually less deadly than the, than the actual average flu virus. If you look at the, the death rates, the death rate's actually lower. The difference between the, the flu virus and the coronavirus is the coronavirus lives longer in the <laughs> wild, so to speak, so it's easier to transfer. And so that's actually the real danger. But quarantines actually aren't going to solve, really solve that problem. And it's so hard for me to, uh, to trust the information coming out of China because it's coming out of China. You know, I don't trust information coming out of Washington, so I'm not going to trust the information coming out of <laughs> Beijing. And so is it 2,000 or is it 20,000 or is it 200? Mm -hmm. You know, how many of those people are political prisoners that they're just using as an opportunity? Is it, is it one? Is it 100 or is it zero? I actually don't know because I get, you get so many different, on the underground kind of libertarian um, underground where you kind of hear some things, is you're actually getting different you're actually getting two different stories. You're getting the story where they're, they're using it to attack dissidents, and you're getting these other stories where it's not as bad as it is. is. They just wanted to tamp down the protesters. And there's this other group that says, no, nah, that's pretty much exactly what they're saying. And so you, we don't really know what's going on. And so for, for the rest of us who are, who are so um, cynical about the information coming from these government sources, I, we don't know what to do. You trust the fact that the, for me, I trust the fact that it's a kind of a, a light flu that's easier to catch. I guess so, but, well, just to assume, I guess, to, to play into the model, though, I guess if we could trust it, should we be okay with something like a quarantine? Because uh, just to get at the meat of the issue, you know, libertarians, I mean, you're, you're literally talking about one person's individual freedom versus society's benefit. Yes. Yeah. You know, you know, I mean this this raises a very interesting a very interesting issue, you know, Jason. Because this is an issue where we're talking about public safety versus individual rights. And that is always a, a, a difficult issue for me. Because and especially when the government is involved with this crap, okay? Because when you think about it, if you go back to World War Two, if you remember Japanese Americans, some of them were American citizens. They were interned 
only for the reason that they were Japanese. Okay? So we have to be very careful when the government is involved in any of this stuff. But there's a serious issue here. Like, should we allow people who say have been in, in Wuhan, China, to come back into the United States and just walk back in the United States as if nothing is wrong? When indeed we know it is possible that they may have contracted the virus and it could be spread to me, to you, to my children, to my grandson. I mean, who I would never want. And the virus so the, doesn't respect property rights. Exactly, <laughs> right, exactly. It doesn't respect property rights. You're absolutely right about that. So there's this, this conflict that you have to deal with. I mean, as, a, as someone who tend to be a libertarian, I would want to respect the individual rights. But then I have to be worried about other people in my life, my wife, my children, my grandson, who could come in contact with people who may become infected by this virus. So it's a real difficult to see which I'm probably like you that I don't know where to fall down on this issue. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, really I, think, I kind of think we, we don't, we didn't isolate AIDS patients, you know, even though it's a deadly, a deadlier disease. We, we don't actually crack down on drunk drivers, on, on people who drink because and it's far more deadly. So, you know, this, this notion that it's safety, it's individuals' rights versus group safety is, I don't actually necessarily buy that. Now, I do think that it's a genuine issue and we're concerned, and that I don't actually mind that, hey, you know, if you're going to fly back from China, can you kind of please? Mm -hmm. Can you do us a favor? You know, I know it's an inconvenience. I know it's a, it's a pain in the butt. But can you please do us a favor and go through this quarantine mm -hmm. process? And just ask them. I bet you 99% of the people, if you ask them to go through the process, if you explain why, they'll do it. I would. As my, I would complain and I'd you know, moan about it, but I would actually go through the process. I'd sit there, okay, fine, and, and go. And sit. I think most people would rather take the two weeks or whatever it is to sit through the quarantine to not you know, endanger their society rather than, but I think, you know, Let's start with voluntary. Let's ask first before we de start demanding. So you, sh you don't think they should be mandated? They should be mandated to go through the quarantine? I think we should. I think we should ask them for people first and we'll see if there's actually a problem of people wanting to actually go. But then, even if they accept it, even if they accept the, um, they say, okay, fine, I'll go through the quarantine. Mm -hmm. One week later, they say, well, we know the virus has a has an incubation period of, of two weeks. But one week after they agree to go into it, they say, well, you know what? I'm tired of this. I'm leaving. Well, but what, if then, not, what then? But at that point, if, if after a week and they haven't been sick, they're probably fine. To bird, they're probably fine to go ahead and move on. So, well, no, but I'm not sure that's correct, quite frankly. Yeah, but neither am I. But I'm also not sure that I'm willing to tell someone that they have to stay in a cage because I said so. Well, you know, another, another <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, this issue is highly related to science and, and, and the information we trust from government. Another uh, topic I wanted to touch real quick before we run out of time is uh, the issue of uh, trans females competing in female athletics. And recently there's been a uh, court challenge to that in Connecticut. Yes. Um, but uh, the ACLU thinks that we should uh, allow them. Other libertarians, what do you guys think? I say no to that completely. It's a, it's <laughs> a no. very complex question, and I think we need to have a complex discussion. Yes, yes. Okay. For another time. Indeed, indeed. <laughs> uh, so thank you for joining us. Uh, you can catch us on YouTube, Channel 17, and Facebook on Libertarian Counterpoint. And you can catch some of our old shows, too, as well.